Thank you very much, uh, uh, Brian. Before I start, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past and present. What I'd like to do today is outline five areas, divide my presentation and discuss five issues. What we know from the research, and there's a robust, uncontested body of research about the importance of young children. Share with you a snapshot of what we're seeing now, and just echoing what Brian says, we've made good progress in the last 10 years compared to other countries. But I'm going to take this, the approach that the glass is half empty, not half full. Uh, hypothesize about why we're not doing better, some of the challenges we have as policy makers, as advocates, as service managers in trying to do better. Ask the rhetorical question, do we need a different approach? The answer obviously is yes. And then suggest a framework for how we might do better. This is what we know from the research, which as I said is robust, it's uncontested. All of us in the room will know the importance of early childhood, the importance of building strong foundations. What happens to a young child in those early years builds the foundations for lifelong competence and adjustment and health and well-being, or the converse, puts that child at risk of problems later on. And this is what the neuroscience of brain development says to us, that the brain architecture and skills are built in a very rigid, hierarchical, bottom-up sequence. And those foundations that are laid down in those years well before the child begins school are very, very important. And skills beget skills. If we don't get it right in those first few years, it's so much harder to get it right later on. And what happens over time is the plasticity of the brain decreases and it becomes harder and harder to change. Those of you in the audience that have tried to pick up a skill as an adult, whether it's learning a musical instrument or a sport or a new language, of course we can do it because the brain never stops learning. But it's so much harder the longer we wait. So the research is very clear that both biologically and economically, it makes much more sense to get it right the first time than to go back later on and try and, think, try and fix things up. And we know from the re research that any sort of adversity operating in that child's environment has the potential then to impact negatively on brain development and put that child at risk of long-term consequences. And the bi biology of adversity starts in utero, and it begins because the fetus and the, the young, then the young child tries to adapt to that particular environment. So it confers short-term protection, but has long-term consequences. And as the late Clyde Hertzman used to say, it leads to changes in the genetic material. He calls it the biological embedding of environmental events. So after a couple of generations of continued stress in that young child's environment, we start to see changes in the genetic material. And stress in those early years then affects the biological systems in the body, the immune and the cardiovascular and the metabolic regulatory system, and it resets them at a different level. And that's the cause of that lifelong vulnerability. And this has been termed as toxic stress in the literature prolonged exposure of a young developing child's brain to persistent adversity in the child's environment. And we see this in situations of extreme poverty, child abuse, sexual abuse, me uh, parental mental health problems, uh, substance abuse, exposure to family violence, etc. And what's particularly important in these situations is there's no adult who can buffer that stress. There's no adult that can make it okay. And indeed, the adults in that child's environment may be the cause of that stress in the first place. And as, as I said before, that resets all the body's biological systems and can lead to lifelong problems. And these are some of the adult problems that have their origins in pathways that begin in those early years. And this is a, a, a literature that's becoming more robust by the month. We understand now through this mediated stress response how the young child, as he or she grows up, then becomes vulnerable to this range of problems. And what's striking about this list, every time I look at it, is the diversity. It's not just social problems, it's not just mental health problems, but there are hard, what we call hard problems like cardiovascular disease and diabetes and stroke and even some cancers now. 
The, the economists are now coming to the table and saying that investing in young children is the best economic investment that a country can make. This is James Heckman, who, as you know, won a Nobel Prize uh, about a decade ago, a bit longer, for some very obscure um, topic that I remember reading at the time and I couldn't understand it then and I certainly can't remember it now. He now goes around the world arguing for increased investment in early childhood. And he's not a bleeding heart like we are. He's got that dispassionate training of an economist. He simply looks at the data. And he argues that up until about the age of eight, any investment that we make in young children should be considered just that. It's investment, it's not expenditure. Because you get a yield back many times what you put in. And the earlier you invest, the greater the yield. And a couple of years ago, PwC looked at uh, early childhood, looked at childcare and the benefits of high quality childcare. And they argued that there were significant savings to be, to be held economic savings with increased investment in childcare, increased taxes, decreased expenditure on unemployment and other government transfers, and then decreased expenditure associated with that range of poor outcomes that I mentioned before. And this graph summarizes that in those early years, there's an increased government investment, and then year after year, the yield keeps on getting greater. So it's pretty clear that the earlier we begin in, in the child's trajectory, the lower the cost and the higher the efficacy of the inter intervention. The longer we wait, the cost goes up and the effectiveness goes down. And most public policy, not just in this country, but in countries around the world, are at the right-hand side of that graph. As a society, we tend to wait until problems are so entrenched that we can't ignore them anymore. Then we throw money at it, significant amounts of money because it's very expensive, and that the evidence that we can do much is very, very slim. So these are not scientific solutions, they're political solutions. The research is very clear, as the minister said, that investing early makes economic sense. And this is an example. These are UK data that I've translated into Australian dollars. The cost of looking after a child uh, in a social justice setting. And this is not rocket science. The earlier we begin, the cheaper it is and the more effective is going to be our intervention. So even if we don't care about kids, and there are lots and lots of demands on policymakers, we should care about how our tax dollars are spent, and this makes economic sense. So what are we seeing now in Australia in 2017? Well, we're seeing worsening child outcomes. Fiona Stanley used to say that this is the first generation of children for whom outcomes are worse than the previous generation. We see it in physical health, in mental health, increasing rates of child abuse and neglect, and neglect as Brian mentioned, uh, real concerns about academic achievement, social adjustment, this is the AEDC, the Australian Early Develop Developmental Census, which started life as the AEDI, the Australian Early Deve Developmental Index. This is a 110-item uh, questionnaire completed by teachers in the first year of a child's formal schooling. And we don't uh, uh, score for individual children. We aggregate the results and feed them back to schools and communities, etc. So these are Australian data. So you can see that one in five, one in four and a half children arrives at school developmentally vulnerable in one or more areas. One in five. In some communities, it's every second child arrives at school already in some sort of trouble. And what we expect schools to do is to compensate for the first five years before the children get to school. And no matter how good the school is, it's a very challenging task because Remember I said that the uh, plasticity of the brain decreases over time. By the time these kids are five, it's already getting very, very hard to change their brain wiring. And this is represented in this photograph. You can see the tear. This is a normal school entry group of children. Those to the right of that tear, uh, two out of every five kids, two and a half out of every five kids are not going to make it. I'm talking about group terms. They won't make it in terms of their potential, their aspirations of their parents, 
the aspirations of we as a community because they don't get a chance in those first five years. And these are child abuse notifications and substantiation, substantiations. You can see there's a rise year after year after year. So we're now seeing over 300,000 notifications across the country. Now, the sub number of substantiations has remained reasonably uh, constant. Now, I'm not a child abuse expert, but I suspect that this is a sign of families in trouble looking for help and the children are at major risk. And this is out of home placements. These are, these are Victorian data. You can see that uh, I'm really worried about the um, three to the number of out of home placements in young children, but this is the slide I'm worried about. Zero to four, the number of children, by the time they're four, already have had three to five different out of home placements. So at a time when the developing brain is screaming out for consistency, stability, nurturing, these are kids that are being shunted from one place to the other. And then mental health, child mental health is the elephant in the room. It comes up in every single conversation. These are Australian data from a couple of years ago. Almost one in seven children between the age of four and 17 were assessed as having a mental health problem. So that's over half a million Australian children. We also know from the research about the importance of social disparities, of social inequality, and that has a major impact on those early years. And those disparities between middle-class children and disadvantaged children grow as the child gets older. And again, this seems to be mediated through this stress response that I mentioned before. And these are kids that experience what we call double jeopardy. These are children who would really benefit from going to high quality early learning centres and attending preschool and are the least likely to go. These are parents that would really benefit from having the sort of social, social support that they need and yet we know these are parents that are least likely to attend those sorts of areas. So th these kids are a double jeopardy. So I draw your attention to the right hand part of that graph of women who smoke during pregnancy. Again, you see this social gradient and consequently that gives rise to low birth weight babies. And then this really emerges in the preschool periods. These are data from the longitudinal study of Australian children. You can see for each of these areas, for social emotional difficulties, for communication, for vocab, for emergent literacy, that systematic differences are be beginning to emerge as early as the first three years between children from middle class communities and those children from disadvantaged communities. I shouldn't just say disadvantaged communities, I should just say disadvantaged children. And remember I said before, these trajectories get harder and harder to change as they get older. And these are AEDC data for every single domain, very significant differences between advantaged and disadvantaged children. And we see that we see again children who would benefit the most from going to preschool are the least likely to go, this social gradient of preschool attendance. And we see it again for mental health. So we've known that disadvantage confers risk for many, many uh, generations, but this is the first time in the last few years we've got very, very strong Australian data about this. So why aren't we doing better? Um, Keating and Hertzman in this seminal book in written uh, two decades ago almost now, uh, call it modernity's paradox. We are witness to dramatic expansion of market-based economies whose capacity for wealth generation is awesome. At the same time, there is a growing perception of substantial threats to the health and well-being of today's children and youth in the very societies that benefit most from this abundance. And I would argue the situation has only got worse in the last couple of decades. And this wonderful quote from David Green, it is not as if we've lost the knowledge of what has constituted a good childhood, but it seems more difficult to realize it in the context of rapid change. And we have limited ways of protecting, understanding, monitoring, and controlling the impact of progress on children. Shared cultural, political, and moral commitments to children are becoming confused, contested, and weakened in the face of the unstoppable changes, disruptions, and uncertainty. 
And Tim Moore in our centre in, in Melbourne has coined the term social climate change. And we see this particularly gathering pace in the last decade or so. Um, the constitution and makeup of families has changed. Uh, more families use childcare. They're working longer hours. There's more casual and part-time work. There's much more job insecurity and homelessness. And the social gradient, that is the difference between advantaged families and disadvantaged families, has simply grown in our very wealthy economy. So well-resourced families tend to do well. There really has never been a more exciting time to be alive, as our Prime Minister says. If you've got the means, if you've got the capacity in the family to take advantage of that. But many families, uh, not just in Australia but in other countries, feel left behind. And that's why we see Brexit, that's why we see Trump, that's why we see uh, Le Pen, etc. Lots of families are feeling badly done by. They can't take advantage of all the modern things that we take for granted. So there's an increase in the number of families with complex needs and there's more intergenerational disadvantage. So this challenges all of us and there are no silver bullets. Uh, these have been termed wicked problems and the interventions to address wicked problems are very complex. They're hard to evaluate. From a, a policy point of view and an advocacy point of view, prevention is invisible. We can't see it, we can't touch it. There are no plaques on building, there are no announcements to be made. We need a long-term horizon and governments are elected for short periods of time. We don't have the language right. We need to think more about how we frame these sorts of issues. And we have Australian data suggesting that in this country there's a widespread suspicion of science and of government. Lots of families push back and talk about the nanny state. We don't want government interference. This is a lovely quote from, from H.L. Mengen. For every complex problem, there's an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. There's fragmentation of advocacy, policies, and services. There's fragmentation of advocacy. In this room, uh, we're not on the same page. We each have our own pet advocacy projects. There are advocates for children. Lots of people advocate for, advocate for parents and families. Uh, there's a, a myriad of issues that affect children. And we all go to Canberra with different agendas. When the steel lobby or the oil lobby or the banking lobby goes to Canberra, they mostly speak with one voice. We want government to do X. When we go to Canberra, we want them to do 4,000 different things. And I feel a certain, more than a certain sympathy for government ministers. If we can't be clear what we want for our children, how can governments react to that with good policy? There's fragmentation of public policy. Mostly policy is delivered in unconnected and narrow programmatic silos. There's vertical fragmentation between the different levels of government, Commonwealth, state and local government. There's horizontal fragmentation both at a federal and a state and a local level between gif different government departments. There's fragmentation by age and there's different targets, child protection, family violence, single parents, etc. We speak with a thousand voices. And there's fragmentation of services. If we go into any community except the most remote communities in Australia, it's not as if there aren't um, services there. We are the lucky country compared to other countries in terms of the range and the quality of services. But again, they're fragmented. So you need a road map. You need a university degree to negotiate your way around these services that exist in the community. This is a slide of uh, work the Centre for Community Child Health did uh, in a community not far from, uh, from our centre. Uh, it's a complex slide because it's a complex journey. This is a child looking for help, trying to negotiate, whose parents are trying to negotiate between health, education and welfare. There's new referrals everywhere, there's duplication of histories, there are issues transport issues, this service is on the other side of town, there are waiting lists, there are eligibility requirements. And this is a slide of work we did in Dufton a number of years ago where we mapped all the services in the city of Dufton. You would think from this slide the last thing we need is more services. We need glue to glue these services together. 
So this is the rhetorical question, do we need a different approach? Um, I think we do. And science will often give us the answers, not always. But if we look to science, we'll often get some clues as to what the evidence shows, what the research shows. Um, that we need to uh, uh, under-promise and over-deliver. There's a difference between what we think we can do and the reality of working with children and families. A very good quote from Lynn Briggs, tackling wicked problems is an evolving art, I would say, and science, I would add to that. They require thinking that is capable of grasping the big picture, including the interrelationships among the full range of causal factors underlying them. They often require broader, more collaborative and innovative approaches. Uh, we're very, very pleased to see there's more and more interest in use of evidence, evidence-based approaches, but uh, there are some caveats there as well. And there's two assumptions in using evidence-based programs and evidence that uh, we think are of concern. One is that so-called proven programs are not permanent solutions to static problems. And secondly, there's an assumption that we can take a program uh, that's been a, 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 um, published in the literature or is commercially available and just apply it to any community group in this country. And they're two major flaws in our thinking. Again, this is uh, Tim uh, Moore's work. There are different types of fidelity. The one we always traditionally pay attention to is what we call program fidelity. That is, we need to deliver a program according to the, the way that the inventors of that program say we should. Um, and that's important. But there's two other fidelities that we often lose sight of. One is process fidelity. How we deliver that program is just as important as what we deliver. And then the third is values fidelity. Does this resonate with the values of the parents and the families and the communities for which it's intended? In other words, how services are delivered are as important as what is delivered. We need some sort of flexibility. In America, uh, this is referred to as identify and refer. The American system is based on checklists. If you score more than a certain level on a checklist, whoops, you've got a problem, we'd better refer you for whatever that is. Um, and that doesn't work. So it's sort of self-evident that relationships should be at the heart of any system. That positive relationships that parents have with us, with service providers, are crucial. How services delivered are as important as what is delivered. We also need to think about different approaches that traditionally we've had, we've had a risk-based approach. We employ a series of risk factors or uh, indicators and we identify families or communities as being at risk. And the problem is that they may not consider they're at risk. And what's worse, we follow up with, we know what's good for you. You're at risk, here's a program that will help you. And then we wonder why uh, the glass is half full, uh, the glass is half empty. Needs-based approach, on the other hand, engages family in a conversation about uh, what do you need to support your raising children in the way that you would like. And there are issues with both of these, of course that we certainly have to move away from identifying people and then telling them what's good for them towards a relationship-based approach where we talk with them in a trusted way to try and build that capacity. So finally, a framework for uh, trying to do better. This is a lovely quote from Don Berwick, nothing hard is ever, e is ever easy. And as, as I said before, this really challenges all of us. This is complex, difficult, messy work it's messy for researchers, it's messy for research translation, it's challenging, challenging for government and policy makers, for those of you working in the field with families and uh, deep in the mud, it's very, very challenging as well. So how do we then uh, move to this new paradigm? Well, it takes a village to raise a child, it, it really does. And this is a lovely quote, what the best and wisest parent wants for his own child must be what the community wants for all children. So it's really about building capacity in families and communities. Children grow up in families, families live in communities. What is it about some families and some communities where children turn out to have issues, where children don't get a chance to thrive? 
And that leads to the obvious question, how can we be working with families and with communities to build that capacity for all children to thrive? So we need a coordinated advocacy, whole of government policy and multi-sectoral interventions. Now, that sort of rolls off the tongue not easily, but easier said than done. So is it possible for all of us to develop a cons consistent, and clearly articulated message about the importance of young children. The moral ethical one, which says that knowing what we know about what young children need to thrive and prosper, it's not ethical and it's immoral to deny them that opportunity. But even if we don't care about children, it's an economic argument that economists, many economists are now saying that investing in young children just makes economic sense. Can we work together with government to develop a long-term, not well beyond a single election cycle, and a bipartisan and evidence-based plan? Whatever our sector and particular professional interests, is it, com is it possible to have a common narrative? Imagine whatever our particular advocacy and professional interest was. If we all went to Canberra with the same two introductory paragraphs, about children and families. So we reinforce that message all of the time, then branch off into whatever our particular advocacy issue is. And then finally, how can we work in a real partnership with communities and with families? Not identifying them as having problems and knowing what's best for them, but in a real long-term sustained partnership. So the principles are that we can't focus just on the child or only on the parents. As I said before, we have to seek to build capacity in families and communities. Now, this is a, 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 a quote that you all know, give a man a fish and he eats for a day, teach a man a fish and he eats for a lifetime. And that's the problem with policy, that when, uh, uh, no matter how good that policy is, it's funded for one year, two years, three years, then it stops. And the chances are that any good that that policy or that program has done stops with it. So how do we change the conditions in which young children grow up? Uh, a one-size-fit-all is most unlikely to work. And I like this notion of tight, loose controls where governments fund communities and they're very tight on expectations and outcomes. We'll give you this money, preferably in a single check, um, and we expect you to deliver what you said you're going to deliver, whether that's improved language, improved school readiness, reduced child abuse notifications, whatever it is that we negotiate with community, but loose on inputs on the basis the community will know much better than central government or state government or any policymaker how to deliver those outcomes, this notion of tight, loose controls. And that's very challenging for government and for funders. When we know what the cause is, when there's a simple known cause, then we focus on the person. And in traditional medicine, when I see a sick child, I figure out what's going on and I try and treat that child. That doesn't work for complex or wicked, or wicked problems. Yes, we have to focus on the child, but it's so much broader than that. So when problems are wicked and complex, then we try and have a place-based approach. And place is particularly building a profile of that community. What are its assets? What are its strengths? What are its issues? What do we know about the children and the families in that community? What assets are available to support them? Not just services, but parks and gardens and service clubs and so on. What does the current service system look like? What data are available in, in that community to inform planning? And data are a very good way of engaging the community. And then once we have that profile, we work with the communities in partnership to implement that change. So currently we need to move away from this reactive approach to individuals with problems towards a population prevention approach. We have to be looking at groups of children, groups of families. Complex social issues cannot be dealt with merely by interventions with children or by strengthening families or by building community capacity. Policy needs an integrated focus on all three, children, families and communities. So complex interventions uh, 
are targeted not just to individuals, but also try and change families and communities. We pursue multiple goals at once. Very hard to measure, very hard to eva evaluate, as I mentioned before. It's all about relationships. I've said that a number of times before. A one-size-fit-all does not work. We have to develop unique and innovative solutions tailored to that group of families or that particular community. And, and we need to integrate proven and promising practices with ongoing activities. So um, what's very uh, interesting now, what's very hot, is what we call rapid cycle reviews, D setting up learning communities. Where we're continually getting feedback from our activities and modifying activities as we go. I said before that how is as important as what? Evidence-based processes are, are relationship-based. There's that word again, relationships, involves partnerships, targets goals that parents see that are important, not just that we think are important, give them uh, choices and so on. Then the service system, the one of the absolute strengths of Australia compared to other countries in the world is its universal service system. They're not stigmatising, they provide what we call soft entry points. Professionals have trusted relationships with families. Targeting tends not to work. Treasuries are very uh, interested in targeting because if we've only got a limited amount of money, let's give it to those people most in need. But it's stigmat stigmatising. It's often said that services for the poor tend to be poor services. And if we focus just on disadvantaged communities, we actually miss most vulnerable children. And it's far less effective in reducing inequalities. This is Michael Marmot's quote. Focusing solely on the most disadvantaged will not reduce health inequalities sufficiently. To reduce the steepness of the social gradient in health, actions must be universal, but with a scale and intensity that is proportionate to the level of disadvantage. He calls it proportionate universalism. We tend to call it universal plus, where every family gets a basket of high quality um, universal services, and then we add on to that universal base, whatever a family needs. So the service reform does need, to, um, sorry, the service system does need to be reformed. Uh, we need to strengthen that universal system, map secondary and tertiary services, identify the referral pathways, establish feedback loops uh, and so on. And every single provider in a community is engaged in identification and referral. So no matter if I'm a maternal and child health nurse or a preschool teacher uh, or any professional working in that community, if I don't know what the problem is, my antennae are up, I know there's an issue with this particular family, I don't know what it is, but I'll refer you to somebody in our community who can help you and can sort it out and I'll take responsibility for making sure you keep that referral. That's an organised community. So we need, as I said before, we need more glue rather than more programs. How can we facilitate these partnerships and can we create a one-stop shop? Can we take this um, diversity of community-based services and link them up into a virtual one-stop shop? So everywhere a child and family make contact anywhere with a service system, you've come to the right place. If I can't sort it out, I will refer you to somebody who can. I know my community because it's been organised and I'll take responsibility for making sure you keep that referral. So if we did nothing, we know that lots of children's outcomes would be poor. Lots of children would fall away in their, tra their trajectory uh, because of biological and envir environmental risk. We want all children really to have this ideal trajectory. Current practice is where that red line is. We do some good. But we really want to lift all children to that green line. This is Sven Silburn's slide. And this is the opportunity we have as a community, as a society, as a nation, to lift all children from that red line to the green line. I like this quote, the key to success is simple, make people dream. So can we dream of lifting that half-empty glass to full? It is the burden on good leadership to make the currently unthinkable thinkable, to question the obvious, to make the present systems unavailable as options for the future. 
the boundaries in our minds create fear about the consequences of crossing over to the undiscovered country. But the possibilities we really need do not lie on this side of our mental fences. Once crossed, these fences will look as foolish in retrospect as the beliefs of other times now often look to us. Thank you very much.